President and CEO of the Green and Healthy Home Initiative. It's a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to advancing racial <coughs> and health equity and opportunity through healthy housing. She's a national expert and advocate on green and healthy homes. She directs the initiative's groundbreaking work across the United States, where 65 cities, counties, and states are using housing for the platform health and social outcomes. Through the implementation of the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative's comprehensive housing intervention model and its practices toolbox, cities are improving the ability of children to arrive in the classroom healthy and ready to learn and stay in school to reduce asthma-related absences. <coughs> Ms. Norton, Ms. Norton serves as a member of multiple committees, too numerous to mention, but two that stand out are the EPA, Environmental Protection Agencies, Children's Health Protection Advisory Committee, and the National Leadership Academy for the Public Health. I told you it was going to be a little bit long here. <laughs> Ms. Norton, Ms. Norton also provides a leading voice to articulate the significant health and social benefits weatherization investments for her advisory role with NRP Efficiency for All and has authored research publications on the non-energy benefits of energy efficiency. She is a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Community Health Leader, a Weinberg Foundation Fellow, and has received the Tony Woods Award for Excellence from the Building Performance Industry in 2016 for efforts to integrate energy efficiency upgrades with healthy homes and inventions on a national scale. And finally, under her leadership, Green and Healthy Homes has been awarded the HUD Secretary's Award for Healthy Homes and the EPA National Environmental Leadership Award in Asthma Management for its innovative programs. The continued recognition of equity within the framework of sustainability is most worthy of our attention, so please welcome Ms. Norton. Um, so this is my first lecture in a year and a half, so uh, I'm glad to be here. And I had last night, uh, I am 61 years of age, went to the University of North Carolina, and I had my best college experience last night. I went to your dining hall, the award-winning dining hall um, that the guy at the hotel said I should do. And I did, it was great. I felt like I was back to life. So I'm glad to be here uh, with you today. I want to tell you first a little bit about GHHI and why I'm in this work. And um, I will do that as uh, let me just do the screen share. I got it. Oh, you already did it? Yeah. Okay, great. And I've got my slides here. I don't want to, they're going to work. I can do here. Do you see that? Uh, of course. Where should I be pointing? There we go. I want to tell you a little bit about who we are and why I am in the work that I'm doing, uh, because I think it's something we should all care about in this country. We have just come through COVID, where we have asked millions upon millions of families to shelter in place for the protection of their health. We've come through our latest inflection point on racial equity in this country, and the hope that we will start to make meaningful change. 
And the reason I bring that up is because it intersects in the work that I got involved in in 1993. In 1993, I was mentoring young African American boys, yet men, young males, uh, at a place called Franciscan Youth Center in Baltimore. I hung out, played ping pong, cajoled uh, you know, time and interest so that we could also do tutoring. And what I began to find out in my hometown of Baltimore is the number of kids in, that could not read at grade level reading, who struggled through common conversation, who would get <coughs> frustrated and angry much quicker than normal. And I really started to think about what was going on in their lives. Because what I found most is that they did not have the hope for the future that I was raised with. When I was a kid, it never thought differently about going to college or pursuing the things that I wanted to pursue. And as I started to pull the thread and look at this, I came to understand the importance of where the young people that I was working with lived. And what I also came to understand is that in the communities in Baltimore, up to 80% of the children tested for lead poisoning were found to have elevated blood lead levels that were off the charts and really damaging their brains so very early. What I later came to find out, too, is how much they were suffering from asthma and the trauma of turning over units and moving and fleeing bad cases. Many people know the story of Freddie Gray for a different reason from Baltimore. I know the story of Freddie Gray because on the day I started my job in Baltimore, he had his highest blood blood level mm -hmm. of 36 micrograms per deciliter. And we know there's no safe level for lead at all. He suffered from asthma, and by the time he was three years of age, had moved 12 times. The amount of trauma on that young man and his pathway uh, is reflective of so many kids, not only in Baltimore, but throughout the country, where we have a, we have a country that in 1921, when the world uh, adopted a ban on lead-based paint, in residential housing, the United States opted out of that. In 1937, when we put out our first uniform health and housing code <coughs> in the United States, inspired by Florence Nightingale and the good work of nurses, the next year, in 1938, we mandated the use of lead-based paint in low-income housing. In 1904, the Sherwin-Williams Company, one of the largest makers of lead-based paint, had a meeting at their board of directors and talked about why they should not enter the lead-based paint market. Because it killed young children and fetuses, and it was too dangerous. But in 1908, they entered that market with that knowledge. And I lay that groundwork only to say, this is reflective, as you may know, of how we apply the housing code, how we, how we redline for banks, and how we invested. In Baltimore, the neighborhoods that suffered most about this are called the Black Butterfly. The east side of Baltimore and the west side of Baltimore, where all of these policies have continued until current days. So I want to tell you a little bit more about that story as we get into it, but it is the reason that I decided to leave work in the private sector and begin a path to try and level the playing field in the classroom so that every child can compete, learn, and earn for a lifetime on a level playing field. It's a big belief of our organization and the work we do 
that in order to have transformative and tangible steps on racial equity to close health disparities that we have continued to see even as we track the coronavirus, that we have to make substantial investments that we have not made for over 100 years. But we have a great hope in how to get there. And so we're starting that work across the country, right, to do that. These are the places that we are working to change policies on housing condition, not just lead, but asthma, injury, and energy efficiency. In, in 2009, I had written a paper, or 2008, I had written a paper about the need to pay attention to not only the issue of lead-based pain, but the issues around asthma, mold, mildew, moisture, leaky roofs, investment in housing, and to look at energy efficiency. Because what I found out as we started to work with our families over the last 30 years is that we could remove lead hazards from homes. We could address asthma and families would still move because their energy bills were going literally out the roof. And that if we didn't fix lead, asthma, and those things around structural defects, that families would be turned down for weatherization, energy efficiency. So money intended to go to our lowest income families, our families of greatest need, and our elderly. We're not getting there. And our deferral and declination rate in cities like Baltimore, Detroit, Chicago, Philadelphia, were being de deferred and declined at a rate of 62%, which meant that families were never getting the holistic answer that was necessary. So we started to launch an effort uh, that was recognized by the then incoming president, Barack Obama, to lift up the work of my organization, which was called the Coalition on Childhood Bed Poisoning, to become the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative uh, so that we could bring together the needs of health care and the outcomes that we were doing for health care for reinvestment and the fields of energy efficiency. And today I'll tell it to you a little bit about where we are and what's happening in Congress uh, to move that forward. So, the, uh, but it does kind of start here. This is what hangs on my wall when I walk in my office every day. At the Baltimore Sun in 1991, put a headline out uh, that actually kind of doomed the job that I was taking uh, to address lead poisoning. It set our efforts for him to fail. That we would not be able to come back and overcome the, the issues around lead poisoning. I will just fast forward to tell you uh, that I love that headline. I love that headline because today we have a 99% reduction in childhood lead poisoning having returned a $44.5 billion economic return to the state of Maryland. And that's a good thing that we'll hang on to for a minute and a very troubling fact that I'll talk about in just a second. But this is where I was telling you that in some of the neighborhoods when I first took a, a job in an organization that had $17,000 that nobody wanted to touch this issue. A legislature that had 72% of the elected officials in the Maryland legislature were rental property owners. Most of this problem was coming from rental properties that were absentee landlords where there was no housing code being uh, enforced. And we faced this hill. But we knew how to find the problem how to define the problem, what it costs to clean it up, and what it would mean if we did. It meant that children would not die at birth or be still birth, still born. Mm -hmm. It meant that kids would be able to read at grade level reading when they got to the third grade. It meant that we could eliminate a 700% greater likelihood of school dropout rates and a 600% greater percent 
of kids getting into the juvenile justice system and incarceration all because of their where they lived and where they were coming from. We knew that we had to do something. And as I said, we started to do that work around lead, removing chipping, peeling, and flaking paint, getting rid of the, the toxic leaded dust that causes kids to get brain damage. It takes the equivalent of three granules of sugar of leaded dust to cause permanent, permanent, permanent irreversible cognitive damage. But what we learned in that, from listening to our families and listening to the workers that we were sending into housing, who we hired from community to give the opportunity to own the jobs and lead the work, was that we couldn't think about lead alone. We had to think about asthma triggers, mold, mildew, moisture, pest management issues, and things, other things that were causing people to be in the emergency room, in the hospital, and causing long-term impact. And in fact, our first measure that we added to our work in lead was simply to do $10 covers over radiators so that we can eliminate the 1,300 kids in Baltimore a year that were going to the hospital with second and third degree burns. Mm. All of the, anything I'm going to talk to you about today is simple courage and common sense what's needed to get done so that we lift people higher. But what we really started to understand was the impact of energy inefficiency and the undue burdens put on low-income communities for the cost of energy and what it meant for us. It meant turnover rates of 42% a year. And if you think about a young kid who's one, two, or three years of age, one of the most important things for their long-term development is housing stability. And as for older adults, one of the most important factors to be able to pass on your home with market value is the ability to have an energy efficient house, a house that doesn't suffer from extreme heat and extreme cold. Low-income homeowners often uh, lose their house to housing condition, to the cost of maintenance as they age, which interrupts generational wealth transfer, which is fundamental to level the playing field. So we really started to understand the need to do energy efficiency, lead, and healthy housing together to do something we all probably would think is normal to do, to look holistically at what's wrong with the house and how to fix it. And that's not how government worked or was delivering services uh, to families. And what we found by looking at energy efficiency was probably the greatest strides we could make on the reduction of asthma for kids. Asthma is number one reason kids miss school. It's very costly for older adults. And the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Commission on Building a Healthier America told us that at least 40% of all asthma cases can be reduced by fixing lousy housing conditions. But, and keep in mind that when we do that, we also save billions, right, in terms of avoidable emergency room visits and hospitalization. And we do something really critically important by addressing all of these things. We address the social determinants of health, which is the hallmark of the Affordable Care Act and where health care is trying to move as we move forward. So this is the chart that kind of keeps me up every day. 30 million families who wake up every day with the combined issues of lead, asthma, uh, structural defects that cause avoidable trip and fall, and energy inefficiency. But what this chart doesn't tell you is another story that we're working on trying to solve right now. Today in the United States, 
There are 14 million families who make $35,000 a year or less who have imminent lead hazards in their home, chipping, peeling, flaking paint, against most uh, housing code across the country. Imposing harm to their families, they've been in those homes with those hazards during COVID while lead testing has gone down Lead poisoning has gone up in many states. We know high lead rates that we have not seen in years, which we're seeing. But that 14 million homes, that just to solve that problem alone, families making less than $35,000 a year, is a $170 billion issue. This is not lead and water which is also important, but 10% of what impacts a child who gets poisoned. 10% of the cases, it is estimated 10, but at a high end, 20% of the cases in some locations for kids who get poisoned. 80% or more of the children who get poisoned by lead, it's their fault. And in Congress today, most of the money is going to lead service lines, super important issue, really important issue. And thanks to the unions, Congress is paying attention to create union jobs to do that work. But what we have to get them to pay attention to are the community-based, community-driven, and community-owned jobs, which are not often union jobs, nothing against unions like them, but an opportunity to provide work to solve a problem is getting little to no attention. A little bit better this week than it was a couple of weeks ago. I'll talk about that. But we still have to do better. And just to keep in mind, if you, have a, if you train a contractor to do work that does lead, asthma reduction, and energy efficiency, that contractor will start out at a base about $8,000 a year greater than their peers, and in jobs with health benefits. We, that's a study done by the Center for Employment Opportunity, but I know it because we employ crews to do this work. But this is what we're trying to solve, and by solving it, what we are trying to say is that we will return back to the healthcare system at least $150 billion a year. And we set out about a decade ago to prove that fact and have really done really great work in that. But in the Maryland work, just real quick, to, to, that we did, to get that 99% reduction, we built a base so that across the country we can now look at holistic housing. We had to turn that legislature that was 72% rental property owners and tell them that we had to do business differently. We had to clean up hazards before people moved in. We had to ensure that we tested for that. We can empirically know. And one of the things that we did in the work around lead was to say in Maryland that if you did not comply and clean up lead hazards before you rented to a family, it's an illegal rent. And you can't use housing court to collect rent. And what do landlords want? <coughs> Cash, right? They want income. They're in the business for a reason. It doesn't make all landlords bad, but the ones who are not complying can no longer collect rent in Maryland. And we have said we're going to have a standard that we're going to enforce and we're going to do strategic investments. While going along this path, we also banned lead in products and we lowered our lead levels for lead and water in schools. Across the country, we were allowing 20 parts per billion in water to be a safety standard for children. The EPA, even the EPA under the last administration, who I will not tell you, say the name of that administration, but even in that administration, they said there was no basis in science science uh, for that level. 
There is no safe level of lead to go into the human body. It's a neurotoxin that, that impacts the brain, <coughs> the kidneys, the heart, right? If you're exposed to lead, you will have a 16 to 19 greater likelihood, percent greater likelihood of cardiac arrest and a 46% greater likelihood of early mortality. And again, the baseline for all the other ills that housing and energy efficiency can bring. So we lowered that threshold down, we put money in to clean up the pipes, and we put pretty strong standards. And this is how we got to building out additional work, right? To look at across the country around asthma, around lead, and around um, energy efficiency. And in fact, just a small uh, note that we've been working here with the University of uh, Massachusetts Amherst uh, to build out an asthma reduction program by lowering that allergens in the home that's now being picked up by healthcare, which is one of the things that we wanted to prove out, that healthcare should be investing in making kids healthier. Um, and so by doing this holistic cleanup and lowering the rates of kids going to the emergency room and to the hospital, it creates healthcare savings that can be reinvested in cleaning up the home. And we've helped uh, recently on climate action work and on tweaking standards around the Massachusetts law. So we're not, we've expanded that work uh, even here locally. But we built a we built a model program in Baltimore that led to a 99% reduction in lead poisoning. And as I said, created, according to Duke University, and because I went to Chapel Hill, I have to believe that Duke says it, right? Because it's, they wouldn't normally support the Chapel Hill University. But that $44.5 billion economic return by lowering lead before we get to asthma and injury and energy efficiency. They asked me to come down to Durham and uh, give a speech at the Nicholson Center to celebrate this fact. And I couldn't do it. Because what I recognized is that that $44.5 billion economic return didn't change housing condition in Baltimore. I bet you half of you have seen The Wire, right? You've seen other pictures of my fair city, great city. But we cleaned up lead, but did not improve the housing condition and, and did not change materially important things. If we are going to get an economic benefit for something that robbed generations of families from economic advancement, the money needs to go and be tagged to jobs, to rebuilding, and to benefits back to the actual community. So it really was a ground shift for us after 12 years of work to say every contract we do, everything we look at, and every partner that we have, we have to be employing where we're trying to advance work. We have to support the ownership of companies, and we have to ensure that the benefits don't go back to a state treasury that never will see places like Baltimore, but instead must go into community, into the private homes, and looking at that. So all of this work drove us to look holistically across the country on what we we're doing. And so besides creating the first healthy housing program in the country that helped to move HUD to expand its mission beyond lead to healthy housing, uh, by looking holistically at legal services, and relocation, and case management, we began to look at how are we spending <laughs> philanthropic dollars in alignment with government dollars, how are we looking at hospital dollars and healthcare dollars. Most, non, most hospitals, I'm sure you have one here, is a nonprofit hospital. All nonprofit hospitals have to file Schedule H on hospital community benefits, funding that is spent to improve the health of communities. In my hometown, in Hopkins, that number is over $300 million a year that they file on a tax return 
on hospital community benefits. In the prior years, most of those community benefits have been spent on <coughs> doing professional development for doctors, research, and uncompensated care. But in today's environment, where we have the Affordable Care Act in place and, the, and moving that forward, we have a, a greater look at social determinants of health, the uncompensated cost of care has shrunk. So if you just took 30% of those dollars, because 70% usually goes to research and development and professional development, that's 90 to $100 million for a place like Hopkins. University of Pennsylvania, health system, same thing, right? We have the opportunity there to take that money and put it into community health. So recently, we said that we should do that for the University of Pennsylvania Health System, and in Lancaster General Hospital, recognizing that doing housing interventions to lower asthma, to lower lead, to improve energy efficiency, was an important social determinant of health benefit. <coughs> and so they just wrote a check for $50 million. Well, we've also done 40 feasibility studies with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to show that for Medicaid managed care, if you invest in asthma reduction, it's a provable case. We know what it costs today, and we know what it costs tomorrow if we fix the home, right? So in uh, one of our early cases that we did, it, 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 it sort of looking at healthy, safe, and energy efficient housing, was with a woman by the name of La Laquan Young in Baltimore. She was an administrative assistant for the police chief. And she called one Friday night to our office and said she was about to be evicted and worried that she would lose her home and worried that she was going to lose her job. Now, I picked up that phone call on a Friday evening, which should tell you a lot about my social life, I guess. But I talked to Ms. Young. And I listened to her story and I said at first, you know, we're not a jobs agency and I'll get you to somebody who can help you. But as she started to tell me the story about her son, Dwayne, who was in the hospital three times a year, hospitalized three times a year, going to the emergency room frequently, we started to unpack that story of the $50,000 a year that was being charged to Medicaid the school days that he was missing and the displacement that she was facing. And so we, and she had applied to one program, she applied to the lead program and couldn't get that because she had mold in her house. She applied to the weatherization program and got turned down because she had lead, right? And she could not find an answer. And so we really crafted a program that said there should be one stop, we should grade these funds together that come from government, the over 230 lines of funding that come out of the federal government to fix housing, we shouldn't ask a mom or a dad to figure out whether they're 80% of median income, whether they qualify as 200% of poverty. We need to have uniform ways to do this. We need to grade this together. We need to do a scope of work and to clean it up like we would our own houses. And so we started to look at that. But what we also started to look at is building the case for healthcare dollars saved and looking for opportunities for outcomes-based funding and ways to braid this together. So we started to build sort of this whole house approach. And today we look and do a comprehensive assessment. So whether a family comes in because they have bad window, they have a leaky roof, they have a kid with asthma, they have a kid with lead, all coming into the same system. And when we go to the house, we don't look at the one problem. We look at the house and how people are living. We look at resident health and structure of the house, and we start to look how to solve the problem so that we can move forward with opportunity. And so we, we began to braid these things together to look at the business case. If you invest a dollar in lead poisoning prevention, 
you're going to return somewhere up to $221 for the dollar invested. You invest a dollar in asthma reduction in the home, you're going to have up to $14. Mm -hmm. So we had a business case uh, to lay out on this. And we started to look at how we could better employ contractors, build a more important market for them to work in uh, more holistically. And we studied <clears throat> And what did we find? In Baltimore, we reduced hospitalizations by 66%. In Cleveland, about 58%. All great. In Philadelphia, 70 plus percent. Reducing the time that kids were in the emergency room <coughs> or in the hospital and translating that to when they could be in the classroom. And if you've ever had asthma, I have asthma, it is really scary. And kids do die from it, and it's traumatic, and it leads to other problems. And if we're able to get asthma reduced, and they can get to the classroom, and they can show up with, their, with, with good brain uh, function and health, we start to change uh, the future. And the studies started to prove that. We evaluated it, we looked at the data systems, and we taught others how to do it. And we started to look at the benefits of energy efficiency as well. As we're looking at the issue of climate and carbon reduction, we wanted to know how does it impact the individual? Because we want people to be engaged in carbon reduction in their home, we want them to be engaged in energy efficiency, but you have to feel it to want to be engaged in it. You have to see the marker, not only the cost differential, but the health benefit. And so we've built the largest body of uh, evidence and work on non-energy benefits. And that is driving the conversations today about what we are going to do about weatherizing and uh, putting energy efficiency measures and low-income housing at huge scale. Come, if we're able to get the three and a half trillion dollars out of Congress. And what Congress has said and what the city of Santa Ana said recently in a, a city council uh, a resolution that they did in California <coughs> is you have to clean up lead, you have to clean up toxins before you can weather us. And before you can go to electrification, which is the goal of many climate activists, right, and, and to, for climate protection, you have to first weatherize. You can't get to electrification unless you can make houses healthier and stronger and safer. And we're going to pay attention to make sure we make the right investments in doing this and not leave behind, again, uh, low-income communities. So we've written a number of uh, really important pieces on this. If you can't sleep one night, you can read that 165-page piece on energy, uh, non-energy benefits. But we've really become a leading voice on how do, we, how do we make sure we don't make the same mistake we made around lead, around housing code, and around housing investments in low-income communities as we advance climate action and as we advance energy efficiency work. And we have to lead that with equity. We have to look at the same equity measures on whether or not we're going to invest in housing. And for those who care about climate and residential housing, electrification being the goal, we have to pay attention that we, we not only don't leave behind low-income communities, but if we do this work on electrification and it will cost more in the short term, we have to be willing to provide the subsidies to ensure we keep low-income communities on pace, but do not create an unintended consequence of undue burden. So we have to be thinking about policy, practice, and cost to ensure that we engage folks. When we look at measuring health and racial equity, we're looking at six dimensions of equity. We look at the historical legacies and where the communities have been left out and go deep there. We're looking at how <coughs> do communities understand these issues and how are they engaged including their voices, and ensuring that we have community input into the outcomes 
Because we can say we want to make housing better, and we can say we want to hire contractors and want to have better school outcomes. But we don't want to invest with our ideology. We want to ensure that communities are looking at that and that we are really laying out the data. So my vice chair of my board is a woman by the name of Beth Flower, and she runs a thing called the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Tracker. You've been seeing it on the news, right? It comes out of the Center for Civic Impact. And she said very early on in, in, during COVID, she said one of the greatest underlying conditions that we are not addressing by COVID <coughs> are housing-related health issues. So as we look at data, right, this is an important thing to look at and where we put money, but we also have to ensure that we are incorporating the voice of community in that. So just quickly, I'll run through. These are some of our partners, right? They're really important. Uh, some nerdy, like Milliman, which is the nation's largest actuarial firm, does all the actuary work for healthcare systems. The Trust for America's Health and APHA. Big banks, big philanthropy, but also small community organizations. Uh, and being able to tie from the community to the White House is part of our job. Part of the reason that we're doing the work we're doing is because community organizations haven't got the voice uh, to look at it. But we, if you will see this, what we are bringing together is utilities, with Medicaid, with energy departments, with, uh, with uh, healthcare, with community action agencies, and trying to bring them all to think together about how do we align and bring our efforts in housing. So here's a couple of examples of things we've done we think are important. We created this thing called the Housing Upgrade Benefits for Seniors. It's won all sorts of national awards. Because one of the things that was really important to us was the 60% of our families that were intergenerational were the older adult in the, in the home, it was often the homeowner, was on the verge of losing their home because they might have to go to assisted living. And how did we improve the quality of their home environment so they can age gracefully in place with better health? The first was energy, right? Extreme heat, extreme cold, impacts respiratory and impacts cardiac health for older adults. Also trip and fall injuries and those that are avoidable. I had a mother who broke her hip, who was perfectly healthy, and six months later, I lost her as an older adult. The health declines had come. But being able to think about older adults as part of healthy housing and their role in intergenerational households and the role that healthy housing plays in intergenerational wealth transfer, critically important. And so we're starting to see this program replicate across the country. Uh, in partnership with a program called Capable, which comes out of Hopkins, uh, and a really important, important one to look at. Highest return on investment you can get in fixing a house is doing the injury prevention work. So we also uh, created a grant program for the New York State Energy Administration, Energy Research Development Authority, where they were only putting in energy efficiency money, and were not getting the traction because they didn't do the health and safety work. So we've created a new fund that does that. And in the second and third year, we'll get payback. And we'll start to see the payback of Medicaid managed care because of the savings that we create by doing this investment. And that's being modeled by lots of states around the country. In New Jersey, we got hired by the Board of Public Utilities, right? A former led organization out of Baltimore and started with a budget of about $17,000, right? This is pretty good work that we're doing today. Really, I have an amazing staff. But here, Governor Murphy's, the Board of Public Utilities, has asked us to look at how do we think about climate, electrification, energy efficiency through a lens of healthy housing. How do we bring these programs together how do we get agencies who never thought they would lead on health to lead on health? And then how do we get the savings created 
to get paid back through health care, through the hospital and community benefits, through Med Medicaid managed care, and through the Community Reinvestment Act dollars that every bank in this country has pledged to racial equity and how do we get them to invest where they need to invest to be able to, to create healthier uh, and more stable housing. And so we'll be doing that work. This is a, a bit of a look at where we've done these health projects around the country, including here at UMass, uh, Amherst, uh, but across the country, uh, really look in red and blue states, we get common support for this work. Uh, so I will, I will claim that it's, it is a bit bipartisan uh, in, its, in its work because it's proven, because health systems know where they need to go, educators know where we need to improve things, uh, about where kids lay their heads down at night, uh, and so we've got a lot of common uh, work here. I talked to you about the Penn Medicine uh, check, right? $50 million coming out of a hospital to improve lead in a community that's 90,000 for their city and less than 500,000 for the county. And something to think about is that health systems don't save dollars by preventing lead poisoning because there's no treatment to prevent lead poisoning. There is chelation to save kids from dying, but there's no treatment. So it's not like asthma where if we reduce asthma, we will reduce the ER cost and the hospitalization and the medicine. So this is really to improve the future of Lancaster County. ProMedica is one of the nation's largest Medicaid managed care organizations. They pledge a billion dollars on social determinants of health. And they're putting $100 million into improving housing. And we're, we're going to do 1,000 units in Baltimore, Chicago, and that list of cities that you see there with the, with the commitment to hire from community, have communities drive this work and be able to create uh, healthier housing. Some other things that we're working on, I don't know if anybody's in public health, but we've worked with a lot of states to draw down unused administrative dollars from a program called the Children's Health Insurance Program. It's for kids who don't quite qualify for Medicaid, just slightly above that. Uh, it was uh, actually designed and pushed by Hillary Clinton uh, when she was First Lady and then Senator and moving that forward. But most states don't use the administrative dollars that come with this, which means that we are leaving about a billion dollars a year not going to work in communities. So communities can apply to get these unused dollars and put them into different causes. And when Flint happened in Michigan, we worked with CMS to help redirect $123 million to clean up housing and lead service lines and started uh, out of this money. But we're now doing lead and asthma programs throughout the country to improve healthy housing. But it's just taking a look at what is existing, what's not being used, and putting it together into better use. And so we've got a number of these programs that are happening around the country. This one's kind of interesting. In the Bronx of New York, as a post-COVID response, we are investing with uh, Affinity Healthcare, now purchased by Molina, to go do asthma reduction, indoor air quality, and improve housing uh, as a protection for health, for families who've been hunkered in their homes. And it's all gonna get paid by cost savings by lowering health care bills. So the lenders, Northern Trust uh, is the main lender in this, along with my organization, will not get paid back unless it's successful. So it's all outcomes based to say, we know what measures work, and if they work, the health care system pays back the bill of $5 billion. If they don't work, they don't get paid back, and that's the risk we're taking, but we know it works. And so uh, Northern Trust, which is one of the nation's largest commercial banks, uh, has agreed that the evidence is there and is modeling what other banks can do around the country uh, in doing this work. That's a little schematic on it, how it works. And then the, the, one of the last things I'll tell you about is big 
funds, not only for lead, but for helping housing that governors and mayors now understand the import of this, and not only using American recovery dollars that have come to them to do this, but places like Michigan, Governor Whitmer has asked us to create a fund that we project could grow to about $750 million to be able to lend money and grant money into the marketplace because it's so important uh, to do this work. And so there's lots of really interesting work happening even around the energy, climate, and healthy housing framework that I would encourage you to look at that uh, and how it kind of uh, crosses into each other. And then just quickly in Congress, so you know, in case anybody wants to make calls, um, we are sitting with a proposal from the House to put $10 billion into this work. On the Senate, they're proposing $45 billion, which would be equivalent to what they're doing in lead service lines. Senate Banking Committee, if anybody's from Ohio, Sherrod Brown is the head of the committee, but also on that committee is Elizabeth Warren. If you're from Rhode Island, Jack Reed, uh, we're really trying to press this. By September 28th, we will know the fate of kids in this country. Uh, but there are also hundreds of millions of dollars going into affordable housing that we've been able to put healthy housing measures in. And this is the $10 billion that uh, Maxine Waters has in the House. But on the other side of this um, is some of the work being done here. Uh, but if we're able to hit our $45 billion goal, we will clean up 3.75 million of those homes, the 14 million homes that we need to clean up. We will create 46,000 jobs, and we will create uh, better futures uh, for America. So we're working on this. Don't know if you have questions. I hope this was somewhat interesting of what you can, uh, everybody I think can be doing, should be doing. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you'll learn a lot about not only policy and the work that's happening everywhere, but my dog Dexter, who is uh, amazing and, and a lowly like me, Orioles fan, now lost, I don't know, a hundred and some games, thanks to the Boston Red Sox and others. Um, but at Healthy Housing has some of the most innovative work. Uh, we need good research on this, we need good advocacy on this. We need good thought around the health of buildings, especially residential homes as a base. So I appreciate you letting me be here. Thank you. Well, before we go to questions, I just want to uh, interject, interject that that was a spectacularly engaging and appropriate address for where we are. I know you just applauded. It would be okay to applaud you. <laughs> uh, first half, questions? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Go to the room. They got one? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm kind of interested in sort of the history of, of lead paint. You, you indicated that around the turn of the century, they knew it was dangerous, and then Sherman Williams goes ahead four years later, puts it on the market. And then in 1938, I think you said it was mandated that they use this. By the federal government. By the federal government. Why is, it, it, it can't just be economic benefit. Why was it so, uh, people so insistent on, on using this material that they knew was hazardous? Let me just tell you that Beethoven died of lead poisoning. Ben Franklin wrote about it. Historians will tell you that the Shang Dynasty and the Roman Empire also uh, were impacted by it. So this is not new, right? Um, and we knew in the early 1900s that babies were dying from this, right? Uh, it was mandated because lead paint was a beautiful, painted on, shiny, hard, like a hard resin. So for maintenance, it would cost them, right? And where you found lead paint at that time was in the lowest income housing and the really wealthy. Right, and, but that's the reason. I will tell you that Baltimore was the first place in the country uh, to ban the use of lead-based paint in 1951. We are still grappling with the toxic legacy of lead. Uh, and it took Congress until 1978 um, with the efforts of Ted Kennedy, who led those efforts, but Joe Biden, who really got behind it. 
uh, and President Biden has a couple of places in this story. That, hoping to get that ban on uh, residential, uh, sale of residential lead based paint. And also in 2009, when the Obama administration asked my organization to go national, it was Joe Biden who gave us a transformational grant uh, to, to take that uh, forward. So I'm trying very hard to tell him what he needs to do now. Whether he listens or not, I don't know. We'll see. But, uh, but that's why. Right, the, the, that it was just low, lower cost maintenance um, and the lobby of the paint manufacturers. Oh. If you look back in the history of the paint manufacturers, they ran sort of the Guinness ads, like lead paint's good for you, it'll make kids happy. They had coloring books and all sorts of stuff. And yet, we've only had one successful lawsuit against the paint manufacturers in this country, brought by Kamala Harris in, North, in California. Um, Sheldon Whitehouse sued them successfully in uh, Rhode Island, won, and then the Rhode Island Supreme Court took away the damages. This was tried in Wisconsin. Uh, but California actually got it to stick. They won a, a billion plus dollars, but the settlement, when it came down, was $100 million, not nearly enough. Uh, and mainly that's because here, 50, 60, 70 years later, it's very hard to prove market share liability, whose paint's on what wall. We let it go. We, we let something happen, right? Um, and the paint <coughs> manufacturers will tell you that it's a use, right? If it's not chipping, peeling, or flaking off the wall, now this is 100 years later, right? It's a fine product. But when it does, it causes serious brain damage. Hypertension and cardiac arrest and everything else. But it goes to how we do housing care, too. And the coding lobby is incredibly powerful. You just look around your own environment, <coughs> almost everything you see is coding. When you drive down the highway, you look at those traffic lines. For a period of time, Baltimore Paints was the largest manufacturer of coatings in the world because they pretty much supply all the traffic. All those lines that go down thousands of miles of highways. So the tough guys to fight. Yeah. Yes, sir. What's your name? Uh, my name's Ben. Hi, Ben. Um, so I, I really thought it was interesting that you, you pointed out that uh, the hospitals can capture the savings due to, to reduction in asthma, but can't capture the savings to lead division treatment. Um, and it just, it makes me wonder, well, how could we capture the savings from all the other parts of the economy where reduction in lead... Well, we do, huge. right? But we should. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But education, right? right? Um, I mean, it, and I look at lead and asthma really coming in as twin towers of disaster, right, in, in some respects, or what I call the twin tragedies of deteriorated housing stock. Education in, at third grade level reading. Graduation rates. Kids who are poisoned by lead in today's dollars will earn somewhere between a million three and a million and a half dollars less than their peers, right? And asthma, I mean, has great impact on that as well. But it's reduction in crime. It's reduction in abandoned housing for landlords who say, I don't want to clean it up at all, right? Um, and you know, very few states are like Massachusetts who very successfully moved forward in Maryland to enforce this. Still states are very, the other states have heavy property owner rights. People just abandon the house instead of cleaning it up. So there's significant costs that can happen if, if I, this is the whole, kind of what we're doing with the Infinity Healthcare Project on asthma, right, is proving those cost savings. Uh, one of the reasons it doesn't really happen in the private market to do that as much is because it's a long-term play. Uh, it's, you can, for lead, it's really the lifetime of cost, right, and that would make it a 30, 60, 40, uh, you know, a 50 year bond. Um, as well, you can prove in three months, and so the return starts faster, right? Injury, the same thing. <coughs> and in energy efficiency, you can see the same thing. But if we just took a look at 
the disinvestment or where we did not drive grant programs or grant access and all of that. The other calculation that I think really would astound people, however they view racial equity, is the, is the earning power that we depleted and what that dollar amount is and how we just unleveled the playing field by house a lot. I'm an economist by training, can you tell? Right? I finally found, I did this sort full circle to where it came back to uh, that. And I, and I only majored in economics because I got an A. So. <laughs> Have you noticed since uh, COVID a uh, slight uh, uptick in the attention of your audience when you speak about indoor air quality? Uh, indoor air quality is a good one, right? People feel that. They can, uh, we fix a home, people can feel it. You can literally smell it, right? The difference between a musty, damp, musty house and a house that has good ventilation. They can feel it in how they breathe and how they sleep. And so much of this work is motivated by that, right? We can talk about numbers, we can talk about what we know in data, but what we know from families is what they feel, and other things, such as the ability to get to work. Big on parents. We, we focus so much on kids with asthma who are in the emergency room or hospitalized, right? But if your kid has asthma, that's not the only time you're going to miss work. You're going to miss work because they can't breathe at night, because you're afraid they're going to have an attack. Um, when we did that study in Baltimore, on indoor air quality, energy efficiency, and asthma reduction. Not only did we have a 66% reduction in hospitalizations, we had a 62% change from kids who were missing more than 20 days of school a year to perfect attendance, and an 88% change in parents' ability to get to work. That's life changing, right? It's a quality of life every day, life changing. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm interested in... What's your name? I'm Sophie. Hi, Sophie. Where are you from? I'm from Central Mass. Okay. Nice to meet you. Okay. Anybody <coughs> here? <coughs> so nobody's an order. So I'm here with me. <laughs> Sophie. I'm interested in the act of permission to um, give back to the employment that you were talking about. I think it's critical. With NGVA James I. Sorry? Within your organization, I'm curious if you mentioned an active mission to um, give back to the organization. Not only within, but in the community, right? So one of, the, one of our goals is at the money we raise is to keep, not to bring it to us. Like when we raise money for a community, that 50 million is staying in Lancaster, going to the contractors in Lancaster. But I'll use that as an example where the hospital and GHHI also agreed that not only would they hire contractors in the community, but they would invest in creating ownership for companies where individuals work, individuals of color, low-income individuals, and have that pathway. Um, in our organization, I've, I've, we, we hired a lot of individuals who were under, underemployed, unemployed, and some of our employees came from the South Baltimore Homeless Shelter, who now uh, make a very good wages, right? Uh, and um, they have full benefits and I think part of the fun of that is watching their kids go to college, watching them see their grandkids, see them grow up go to college. Uh, and we have uh, also encouraged people with our support to leave and own their own company. So we had a guy who spun off from us, who owns now one of the biggest weatherization and lead contractors in the city. Um, and uh, who uh, came from one of the impacted communities. And, uh, you know, that's what we like to model in our work, is the reinvestment of that. I, I long ago said that, you know, when I got hired for lead, is that I wanted to see us get rid of the issue of lead so that we would all be unemployed and my job would be like Dave, the movie, to find everybody another job, right? And then I think that's what our goal is, to do that. And we're imperfect about it, right? We've got to, keep looking for opportunities on how do we build equity and wealth. Um, but it, it's a little more concrete than what we do. Thanks for your question. Are 